Good evening. I'm Tim Bolton, Head of Programmes here at Dartington. And on behalf of everyone at Schumacher College in Dartington, I'd like to welcome you to this, our sixth online Joy of Six Schumacher College Earth Talk. And thank you all so much for supporting the work of Schumacher College. We've been holding Earth Talks for a number of years, face to face in the old Poston and the Great Hall at Dartington. It's a fundamental part of our learning community and we look forward to doing so again as soon as is practical. However, Schumacher College has a very long and um, history of debate and research around our ecological and environmental catastrophe. And it feels important in this moment of global crisis that we reach out to our community and those in search of a new normal. As in previous talks, the audience appears to be joining us from across the globe and the presenters are spread out across the UK and the US. So although most of us are in some form of lockdown, the world feels increasingly interconnected and all of us increasingly interdependent. This talk is the sixth in a series of six, which, we've taken, which have taken place every Wednesday evening. If you're new to the series, then all the previous talks are also available on the Schumacher College website, as is an archive of talks from the last few years. We're just finalising the following six talks, which were due to start on Wednesday the 1st of July, based around the theme of seizing the opportunity for radical transformation. Speakers will include Fritjof Capra, Charles Eisenstein and Meg Wheatley, and a full programme will be available very soon. So first, a few words about the format for the evening. In a moment, I'll ask um, uh, Professor Terry Owen to present her talk. We do want the session to be as accessible and interactive as possible. So please do use the chat button on the bottom of your screen to share thoughts with us and your fellow audience members. And we would welcome questions throughout using the Q&A link, again, at the bottom of the window. I'll have a chance to put questions and comments to Terry at the end of the presentation. And during the Q&A session, we'll also be joined by Gideon Kossoff and Tim Gasparek. Gideon is a social ecologist and a social theorist whose research focuses on holism and the tradition of anti-authoritarian social and political thinking. He currently teaches transition design courses to undergraduates graduates, and PhD students in the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon University. And amongst a long list of fascinating roles and projects, he also previously taught at Schumacher College. And Tim is a strategic designer and founder of Strange Attractor LLC where he helps health and wellness, life science and civic organisations to respond to the complex entangled challenges of our time. His interest is in finding ways to strengthen society by focusing on health issues, conservation and the environment and the future of civic life, especially where these intersect to support both equitable and regenerative futures. Tim is based in Boulder, Colorado. In total, we anticipate the session to last about an hour. So let me start by introducing you to this evening's speaker, Professor Terry Owen. Terry is the director of the Transition Design Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and a graduate of the MSc in Holistic Science at Schumacher College. She's been a designer for over 40 years and has taught design at university level since 1986, including as part of a Schumacher College faculty. She was a founding partner and creative director of the transdisciplinary design firm Meta Design with offices in San Francisco, Berlin, London and Zurich. There she directed projects for clients such as Apple Computers, Nissan Motors, Berlin Transport Authority, Audi, Ernst & Young, Sony and Samsung, among others. So welcome back to Schumacher, Terry, and over to you for your talk. Thank you, Pavel. I'm just going to begin screen sharing now. I'm hoping to begin screen sharing now. Okay, hopefully you are all seeing my, my intro screen there. I'm really pleased to be contributing to the Joy of Six Earth Talk series tonight. And I'm going to talk to you about transition design and a research project to map the spread of and response to COVID-19 in the US. My two research partners, as Tim mentioned, Gideon Kossoff and Tim Gasparic, 
are also on this call and will hopefully chime in during the Q&A. This lecture is divided into three sections. Systems problems and their characteristics, systems dynamics, or how systems change and transition over time, and COVID-19 in the US. And given what's unfolding as we all sit here, we've added the pandemic's connection to other complex problems. So complex problems include things like this, crime, income inequality, climate change, terrorism, loss of biodiversity, lack of access to affordable housing and education, and things like global pandemics, and as we're seeing now, racism and police brutality. These problems are also known as wicked problems. A term coined by urban planner Horst Rattel in the 1960s to describe a type of problem that he argued was simply unsolvable because of these characteristics. Now the list is long, but among the most challenging characteristics are that every problem is unique and constantly changing. There is no clear shared problem definition. There are multiple stakeholders with conflicting agendas and these problems straddle organizational and disciplinary boundaries. And every wicked problem is connected to other wicked problems as we can see by the events that are unfolding in our streets around the world right now. To illustrate this, let's take a fairly quickest problem like homelessness. This problem ticks all of Rattel's boxes. And if I asked you what other wicked problems that homelessness was connected to, poverty and the rising cost of housing would probably spring to mind. But if we look closer, we see that it's also connected to a host of other problems, like the high cost of education, racism, substance abuse, gentrification, and many others. Problems like these manifest in most cities, but always in ways that are distinct to that particular place and culture. And the interconnections and interdependencies within a problem cluster like this are so complex, it boggles the mind. It's almost more than we can take in. And so we don't. In fact, we do the opposite. We set about making problems as simple and manageable as possible by tackling little pieces of them and then forgetting that they are part of something much bigger. We do this in a way that we frame problems, fund them, and solve them. So over time, a lot of time, money, and effort gets directed at pieces of much larger problems. And because these efforts are disconnected and fragmented, not much progress is made. We essentially nibble away at the edges of a problem like homelessness for decades or even longer. And it looks something like this. We might identify a more or less manageable problem like the lack of homeless shelters in Pittsburgh where we live without thinking about whether or not it's part of a larger problem. So we raise money to build a homeless shelter or two. If however, we begin to trace the roots of the problem, we might work our way up to the bigger problem of a lack of affordable housing. But if we go further and really look at the entirety of that wicked problem, homelessness in Pittsburgh, then things become really intimidating. But wait, it gets worse. Remember that I said most wicked problems are connected to other wicked problems? If you view those other problems as part of the problem context, it begins to look something like this. And this is the point at which we realize that no single individual or discipline can solve a wicked problem. It requires transdisciplinary collaboration of long arcs of time to effectively address it. And it takes one other very important thing, a better understanding of systems themselves, how they behave and how they transition over time. Essentially, we all need to become students of systems. And systems are perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other and one says, how's the water? And the other replies, what water? 
Marshall McLuhan in his book, War and Peace in the Global Village said, one thing fish know nothing about is water since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. Systems are so ubiquitous and our interactions with them so pervasive, we don't really see them and therefore we don't understand them very well. My work is concerned with how we learn to see systems and understand how they behave. So we live in a world of systems nested within systems nested within systems. There are transportation systems, infrastructural systems, financial, economic, and communication systems, and all of these are permeated by cultural and disciplinary norms, laws, and informal practices, and just general ways of doing things. And together, all of these form what are known as socio-technical systems, all of which in turn are embedded in the natural world. And these systems are always in transition. But despite their constant movement, socio-technical systems are highly resistant to change. They get set in their ways, just like we do. But change they can, as a result of three things, large and small events, technological innovations and breakthroughs, and changes in beliefs, social norms, and practices. So in both material and non-material ways. And any of these changes can happen suddenly or gradually. But let's come back to the concept of transition. Human societies are always in transition, but these transitions have been largely unintentional, full of drift, and we really only understand their ramifications in hindsight. We call it history. The question before all of us in the 21st century is whether we can intentionally transition our societies and organizations toward more sustainable, equitable, and desirable long-term futures. Transition design argues that the long-term futures we're currently transitioning toward aren't necessarily the futures, futures we want. And it argues that we can intentionally change these transition trajectories toward futures we do want. Now, it sounds like a monumental undertaking, but if we use the current situation to think about transition trajectories, we see that all of these countries started at more or less the same place. And we've learned that small changes in the present can make a big difference in where you end up in the future. Transition design is essentially an approach to intentionally shift systems trajectories. The multi-level perspective tool, or MLP, is a framework developed two decades ago in Northern Europe to explain how socio-technical systems change and transition over long periods of time. And researchers have identified three key levels, the landscape, the regime, or status quo, and the niche. The landscape level is where large events, collective beliefs, and social norms begin to impact and fracture the regime level below. Landscape level forces usually accrue and exert gradual pressure, but as you can see, events like war, 9-11, and COVID-19 can appear suddenly and unexpectedly creating sweeping change throughout the system. The niche level is where small experiments and innovations can be incubated off the radar and go unchallenged by the status quo. Niche level events include things like new inventions, technologies and practices, or even radical new policy ideas such as universal basic income. But the important thing to know is that large unexpected events like COVID-19 always open up opportunities at the niche level that can be exploited for good if you know how to read the system's dynamics. So I'm going to show you just two examples of how change happens in a socio-technical system. There are many, many more. Here, conditions already present at the regime level begin to constellate and exert pressure from within, opening a fracture and letting niche level innovations rush in. Startups like Airbnb and Uber, combined with social networking technologies, exploited the fracture 
and rushed into the regime. And the speed at which they were absorbed into and transformed the regime was astounding. Their integration into the regime created more fractures and new industry ecologies formed around both Uber and Airbnb, utterly transforming the tourism industry as only one example. Now, a decade later, what started as niche level sharing economy experiments have permeated the regime and led to the rise of the sharing economic paradigm at the landscape level. But with these transitions come myriad unintended consequences in the form of wicked problems like the ones in red. Now, this is how the regime has looked for some time now, but a few weeks ago, Uber laid off 3,500 people in a three minute Zoom call, followed a week later by the layoff of another 3,000 employees. And two weeks before that, Airbnb laid off 25% of their workforce, all because of a major disruption at the landscape level known as COVID-19, our second example, which showed up suddenly as a problem of nearly unprecedented global magnitude. You can actually watch it fracturing the regime in real time, igniting a flurry of niche level activity that is nearly impossible to follow, but which contains within it the seeds of paradigmatic change for both good and ill. And as we observe this accelerated transition that we're in, we have to try and anticipate the unintended consequences of these new innovations and challenges to the regime so that before they turn into wicked problems, we begin to intervene. But even more importantly, we must quickly read these systems dynamics to drive positive systems level change and shift our current unsustainable transition trajectories. So in March, April, and early May, Gideon, Tim, and I started a research project on COVID-19 in the US. First, we mapped the problem in these five areas to try and understand the interconnections, feedback loops, and stuck places in the problem in the present. In the second phase of research, we went back in time using the MLP to understand how the problem evolved in order to reveal new insights and connections that could deepen our understanding of it in the present. These two phases of research, when combined with a third foresighting and backcasting phase, create a radically large problem context that includes past, present, and future. So the problem map reveals systems, dynamics, feedback loops, and conflicting stakeholder agendas that can be either barriers or boons to problem resolution. I'll quickly walk you around the problem map so you can see that it looks at many different facets of this systems problem. Key insights or issues that are pivotal or urgent have been highlighted in the red boxes. Because of the lockdown, all of our research has been secondary so far, meaning it has come mostly from mainstream news media and special reports. We used scientific papers and articles whenever we could, but it's been difficult because the events are still unfolding. The blue dots on the upper right corner of each node link to our research sources. This problem map is quite large, it's about 22 feet tall, and a discussion about the absolute dearth of appropriate systems mapping tools would comprise a whole nother lecture. We'll begin in the environmental issues section where we can see that COVID-19 is of zoonotic origins, meaning viruses like this make the leap from animals to humans when their habitats are destroyed and new interactions between species occur and or they are brought into contact with humans usually via wet markets, which we see in the economic section is part of the $73 billion luxury food industry in which wild animals are captured or farmed for consumption or for use in some types of traditional Chinese medicine. A key finding is 
that even though we've known about the connection between the destruction of wildlife habitat and viruses like COVID-19 for a long time, and we know that these viruses can be spread via wet markets, this industry has continued to grow and now employs over 1 million people, which will make it nearly impossible to close down. And if we think about legislation that could be passed related to this problem, and we look at that in the political section, we see that policies banning the sale of wild animals are very likely to drive the entire industry underground, resulting in a black market that removes what few high oversights currently exist, which in turn could lead to more pandemics. In the social issues section, we look at what we think and how we act. Here, we see that our attitudes about and relationship to animals is one of the root causes of the pandemic. And many disease experts are arguing that we should view the pandemic as a warning that humans must begin to see animals as partners whose health and habitat welfare is inextricably connected to our own. These collective attitudes are connected at a higher level to collective mindsets and worldviews. And here, American beliefs about civil liberties, individual freedoms, and the right to bear arms have impeded an effective response to the pandemic in the US and are currently shaping our administrations and police responses to the George Floyd protests in cities across this country that you've no doubt been reading about in our fake news media. But there are valid concerns that underlie many quarantine protests. Almost half of US workers' health insurance is tied to their unemployment, and one in five Americans have lost their jobs or are furloughed without pay and benefits, leaving about 27 million Americans without health care and the ability to meet their basic needs. In the economic and business section, we see that this issue is connected to the US privatized for-profit healthcare industry that is part of an economic system that places shareholder profit above the welfare and job security of workers. This emphasis on the for-profit economy shows up in the political section in a way that was actually chilling. In the early days of the pandemic, when it was assumed that COVID-19 was primarily a threat to the elderly, many politicians argued that, and quote, older citizens should be willing to die rather than risk the health of the economy by shutting it down. In many ways, the US system pits the welfare of the economy and corporate profits against the welfare of its workers and citizens. And of course, the backdrop for all of this has been an extremely polarized political landscape. From the start, the pandemic has been politicized by both parties and the Trump administration, and all of that has contributed to the virus's rapid spread and the nation's faltering response to it. In the social issues section, we see that the pandemic has of course left many groups especially vulnerable, such, <clears throat> such as those in forced living conditions like nursing, excuse me, nursing homes, prisons, and military bases. But one of the most tragic consequences in the US that is also connected to the current protests is the vulnerability of our African-American population who are contracting the virus and dying from it in wildly disproportionate numbers. There are many other connections and feedback loops that I don't have time to go into, such as the connection between Fox News and the Trump administration. But for now, I will point out that so far, <laughs> The only one clear positive in all of this, as we all know, has been that our natural ecosystems are beginning to rejuvenate because we humans have simply stopped. So here you see the final map with key insights and root issues highlighted in the red boxes. And these were then used as the basis for the next phase of research, which uses the MLP or multi-level perspective framework introduced earlier to trace the historic origins of these root issues and insights. This map is also very large. It's about 18 feet long and begins in 1770 
with the framing of the American Constitution, which we think has direct bearing on the uniquely American response to, response to COVID-19. Entries in red indicate pandemic-related events, and you can see large events that have shaped the response sitting at the top landscape level. You'll also see that we've articulated a placeholder long-term future vision in which viruses are not common in pandemic, but rather rare and contained, simply to show you how the third step might be integrated into research. Along the timeline, we pull out narrative threads and insights about the past that help us understand the problem in the present. And here we see the roots of the American concern with civil liberties and that right to bear arms. And at the landscape level, we see that a Southern enslavement economy was a key part of the 400 years of institutionalized racism that evolved in the US, which is directly connected to the fact that African Americans are contracting and dying from COVID-19. And as we now know, it's also connected to the current protests around the world over George Floyd's death at the hands of Minneapolis police. The pandemic has thrown a spotlight on all of the infrastructural weaknesses in the US, especially our healthcare system. Tracing its evolution, we see that the founding of the American Medical Association and its early profit-based partnership with Big Pharma that continues to this day, helps explain why the system is so broken. Paul Krugman pointed out in the New York Times just yesterday that the US almost got universal health care coverage in 1947, but segregationists blocked it out of fear that it would lead to racially integrated hospitals. So here we're beginning to see the intersection of the wicked problems of COVID-19, our broken healthcare system, and racism. Another important historical fact is that coronavirus was discovered in 1967. So for over half a century, we've known about it, We've known that it's zoonotic in origin and that it gets into the human disease stream through the capture and consumption of wild animals and the destruction of their habitats through deforestation. We've had this knowledge for half a century, and yet the luxury food industry continues to grow. In the present, the niche level is where the action has been. Incredible innovations, technological breakthroughs, and research were popping like corn just as we concluded our research. And these niche level events are really just the tip of the iceberg. One thing we did notice is a striking difference in the nature of responses around the world. You can see that in the US, the white bubbles on the left, the response has been characterized by new types of collaboration in the private sector and academia as well as what I'll call service offer pivots that leverage existing technology and manufacturing capabilities to respond to a variety of pandemic related needs. In contrast, the response in many other countries has been led by governments and civil service sectors. And this opens up a really important conversation about the need for both top down and bottom up strategies for addressing not just the pandemic, but the other problems connected to it. Transition design research like this aims to create a deeper understanding of the problem and its roots. And when combined with long-term visioning by the stakeholders affected by the problem, it opens up new and more effective strategies for problem resolution. The objective is to develop ecologies of systems interventions that solve for multiple issues simultaneously. This results in in increased traction to actually fracture the regime in an ongoing cycle of intervening and solutioning at multiple levels of scale over multiple horizons of time, resolving the complex problem and shifting the trajectory of the socio-technical system transition it exists in. So this used to be the end of the lecture. But since we finished this research just a couple of weeks ago, the world has changed drastically yet again. COVID-19 seems to have become a catalyst 
for revealing and exacerbating a host of other wicked problems in the US that have been building for decades or even hundreds of years. So going forward, our research would now likely entail the mapping of two other interconnected and interdependent problems, racism and police brutality. We can already see the ways in which these projects are intersecting in the US and transition design argues that we need to frame these problems in radically large spatio-temporal contexts, not zero in on pieces of them. Problem maps like these would ideally be constructed over time by both experts and the stakeholder groups affected by the problem. Focusing on areas of intersection between these wicked problems often reveals what we're calling zones of opportunity in which those ecologies of interventions I mentioned before has the potential to address multiple problems simultaneously. This gains traction and is not addressing pieces of the problem. So these solutions must be connected to each other and the long-term co-created vision. Engaging in a long-term visioning process enables stakeholders to transcend their differences in the present and imagine a future that they all want. This process of problem mapping, long-term visioning and system solutioning becomes an ongoing inclusive cycle in which stakeholders themselves anchor a transition design project that extends for years or even decades as the system's problems begin to resolve and at the community, city, or region begins to shift its trajectory toward a common, equitable, and sustainable long-term future. So the transition design approach is aimed at several things. It leverages knowledge and wisdom from within the system itself it attempts to frame problems within radically large contexts. It attempts to facilitate a shared understanding of the problem and enables stakeholders to co-create visions of a future that they want. The problem maps that I showed you today are available on myacademia.edu website. And if you'd like to know more about transition design, the syllabus for our entire master's and doctoral seminar is up as a website online. It has extensive readings, videos, and downloadable teaching materials, which are being integrated in more than 20 universities around the world. You can also contact Gideon or I um, if you'd like to get on the transition design mailing list. And as a reminder, we um, hope to be teaching a week-long course in transition design at Schumacher College next summer. And as I said, both Gideon and Tim are also going to be on this call, so I hope that they will chime in during the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much. Terry, you've given us so many uh, different things to think about there. And having turned what I already knew was a wicked problem into something which seems even more wicked than um, <laughs> I did at the beginning. Um, absolutely fascinating. We've got some really interesting questions coming up, but can I just ask, first of all, um, it, it appears from everything I've read and understand about transition design that you're really trying to understand systemic problems. You often are using um, stakeholder groups to, in order to be able to um, drive change and, and so on. And it feels to me the area you're discussing, the whole American political system all the way back to the, um, the you know, declaration, um, it, from across the pond, it doesn't feel like you have a group of stakeholders that you could get in the room that would have any common ground. Well, that's a really good point, Tim. But um, one of the things, yeah, there's so many things you cannot emphasize in a, in a talk like this. Well, one of the things we emphasized is the fact that even though these wicked problems are very common and globally ubiquitous, many of them, they manifest every time in place, in place specific ways. And when a community is experiencing one of these problems, there are always commonalities that they share. 
So even though you may uh, completely disagree with someone politically, I mean, we live on a street in Pittsburgh with a lot of Trump supporters. You know, there are many things that we can agree on that have to do with, say, crime in our neighborhood or poverty or safety for our children. And so what we found is, you know, the, the approach is still new and we're trying to develop tools to put it out there and make it accessible to people. But what we have found in a limited basis is that when people get up and out of the problem in the present and they simply focus on the long-term future that they want, that often enables them to transcend their, their differences in the present, which often include, they can't even agree what the problem is. Mm -hmm. But people have an awful lot in common about how they want to live in place, I would say. I don't know if Gideon and Tim, you want to chime in here. Uh, I haven't got anything particularly to add. I mean, we we have been noticing. Um, I mean, I think COVID has been a, an exemplar of how these complex problems manifest differently in different places. Uh, and I was I was listening to a talk this morning in which uh, someone from India was talking about how the the concept of social distancing was inappropriate and confused people because um, families are already used to physical distancing because they have to deal with problems without social distancing because they have to deal with problems like endemic problems like measles and smallpox so they know how to physically distance but when you conflate that with social distancing it becomes very confusing about how they're to behave. So I thought that was a really interesting example of, of how you, you have to really take into account, um, how you have to in, take into account, you know, cultural specificities. Thank you. Um, can I, uh, one of the, Tamsin Smith here is, is asking who was the research for or commissioned it? Um, and with the Ecologies of Intervention Solutions, who would lead and how would such a platform come about? This was a purely uh, speculative project that we undertook with a small team because we wanted to, it's a, it's a way to not only begin to hone the transition design tools, but it was a way I think to to undergo quarantine <laughs> and learn more about the, pro the process itself. The next steps, if we continued it, would be to try and get our head around how to convene stakeholder groups and at what, what the appropriate size would be to continue the mapping process. And I've been seeing some questions <clears throat> popping up about how you convene and define those groups. The way that we've been defining stakeholder groups is that it's any group affected by the problem. And those stakeholder groups are also non-human. And I suppose if you wanted to, you know, think about something like soil, even perhaps to, to an extent not living. So we define it very broadly and actually advocate that advocates for some stakeholder groups would have to be appointed so that their voice feeds in. And it's um, very common for people to be more, uh, part of more than one group at a time. So you might be a member of a community level government, but you're also a member of your neighborhood and you're also a citizen within the city. So, there's a real, we think, art and additional processes that need to be developed about extending this work out in concentric rings. Um, stakeholder groups undertaking these mapping exercises, some of it can be done in workshops, but we think new research techniques are going to have to be delivered or uh, developed in order to reach all stakeholder groups, in order to analyze and feed those concerns into a process. 
it's a little um, misleading in a way to present something like this that was undertaken in such a short period of time because in an actual project, this mapping process would go on for weeks or months and a problem map like this is actually intended to be a living, breathing aggregation of the knowledge and changes in understanding about a problem that continues over time. I think one of the reasons that we don't uh, take systemic approaches to problem solving is we don't have a good way of seeing the whole system. And we certainly don't have a good way of representing our understanding of it as it evolves and changes over time. And Gideon and Tim and I struggled for a very long time. Every, every year or two, we do an audit to see whether some kind of appropriate new tool has surfaced that would allow you to not only map the problem, but the myriad interconnections, and we've yet to find it. I think I was all over the place with that answer. No, no, it's really good. And actually, maybe in a moment, we might come back to some of the process as well, because there are quite a number of questions about it. But um, there's a question here from Andrew uh, Soap, who says, um, Hi, Terry, I'm planning on studying TD at Carnegie Mellon next fall. And one thing I'd love to hear you speak more on is the actionable component of transition design. Is the intention that transition design is more of a way to identify and map disciplines and then letting other disciplines take action? Or does transition design hope to fill the space of both examining and defining the complexity of the wicked problems and then discovering defining actionable next steps? Yeah, that's a really good problem. Um, one of the things we've really struggled with from the beginning is we don't want to create another recipe. First of all, I don't think you can develop a process for solving systems problems because everyone is different and place-based. So we've, we've treaded very lightly. What we're trying to do is come up with tools uh, that people could use in place in situation specific ways to try and understand the system better. And I think the emphasis on using larger problem frames and not smaller ones is something we can really get behind. But Transition design has two facets to it. We really developed it first and foremost as a way to introduce systems thinking and the need for transdisciplinary collaboration to design students. Because there's so many transition initiatives going on around the planet and it was amazing to us how designers were not at that table. And so one of the things we always say to designers is this is not design led. This isn't about designers showing up and leading the process. It's about designers showing up to collaborate in a transdisciplinary dance with stakeholders to try and figure out roughly how to go through this process of understanding the problem, understanding how it evolved, trying to envision where we want to transition toward and then intervening systemically. Beyond that, I think there are so many processes and approaches already out there that can be used. When you get down to the level of designing interventions, you might be having a policy person take the lead in developing a policy. Once you've identified where the most powerful leverage point of intervention is, a regular policy process might kick in. Or in another place, a service design solution might use a service design approach. The point, the point we're trying to stress is it's going to take practically every type of solution that you can think of and more that are relentlessly um, implemented and connected to each other and that vision. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to say there's a lot of good approaches out there that have been used, tried and true. What we're trying to get everybody to do is move up systems levels and put more energy into seeing the whole, seeing the interconnections, and developing, a lot of this is educational. All of us together are trying to develop tacit knowledge about how systems behave. And I think our understanding of them is largely mechanical. Thank you, Descartes and his posse. It's mechanical. So what we're trying to do 
is relearn living system, how living systems work, because that is the knowledge we need to have to know where to intervene. Mm -hmm. Again, Gideon and Tim, I please jump in. I, I was long way. Uh, I would say, Terry, from my perspective, like, like you've covered it pretty well. For me, like the fundamental thing about this is it's a way to have a conversation, some conversation that we're not able to have <clears throat> in the way that we're currently going about it, right? So it's the, the, the reality is that trying to map a, a, an entangled, massively complex, interrelated set of systems like this is, is frankly not even possible. Like it would be as complex as the interrelations between those things in the system would be. So it would be effectively impossible to do it, but it's a way to have a conversation in a way that we're not currently having it. Mm. No, that's really important. Thank you, Tim. Um, Bruce Snadden asks, um, uh, I'm a design educator in Cape Town. How do you at CMU deal pedagogically with students becoming so completely overwhelmed by the massive scale of these maps and systems thinking? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And one that doesn't only apply to students. <laughs> I think we're all pretty overwhelmed in the States right now. Um, you know, I don't think we've been teaching the use of these tools for about four or five years now. And we've never seen people get despondently overwhelmed. Um, I think because they're, they're reading theory and they're trying to intentionally shift their own mindsets or become self-reflective enough to think about that at the same time as doing the work that we haven't seen it yet, or the FCEs aren't telling us that they are, but we try to create an atmosphere in the, in the classroom that's about a lot of permission and emphasizing none of us knows how to do this, but we need to better learn how. And we're finding that the master's students and the uh, doctoral students, but even, even seniors, when we introduce it at the studio level, they are kind of taking it and running with it and developing uh, new tools or ways of using it every single uh, semester, Gideon and I are surprised by an innovation that they've developed that left what we suggested in the dust. Now, I don't think any of us yet know what it's going to be like um, to get out on a project and land it and try to stay with it for maybe 10, 15, 20 years or develop some sort of process that's like a relay race where the stake that your stakeholder champions will stay with it but i think that i bet most of us would agree that the way in which these kinds of projects are funded right now can be rather capricious just about the time that you know you get some traction going the funding organizations are off somewhere else yeah. um, and so how do we collectively develop the tenacity for that? I think that they seem better at not getting despondent than I think we are sometimes. But it's a small sampling, very small sampling, obviously. Mm, no, thank you. Um, Dermot Upton asks, could any of the research team, Terry Gideon, Tim, comment on the relationship between transition visioning and something like pattern language? or how the ecologies of interventions that ultimately get identified after the deep mapping could somehow be related to other efforts across places, geographies, transferable system dynamics and patterns used to the future. Yeah. Well, one of the things, I don't know, I hope this will answer the question. I, I don't know if it will or not. I mean, we're certainly aware of pattern language and I'm absolutely sure Christopher's work has probably informed hours in many ways. He was at Schumacher when, when we were there. Um, one of the things that we emphasize, and when the students are doing the designing interventions assignment, which is the last one, one of the things we emphasize is you should be looking for efforts on the ground that are already underway 
that perhaps needs scaffolding or in the language of gardening, they need watering, but also what initiatives are already up and running that if they were connected to each other and that long-term vision, could they gain more traction for? So I want to be clear that we're not um, saying that it's all new projects or you have to use this approach. We think that doing an audit of, of what is already out there will show you possibilities for connection, will show you new groups that should be brought into a long-term visioning process, but it will also show you where gaps are. <clears throat> it will also show you if you see the system and you start mapping what's already going on, it's like, why is nothing happening over here? Because this node right here is connected to so many other things. Now, nothing might be there because it's too hard or it's gonna require a lot of groundwork with stakeholders. Or it could be that there's nothing there simply because it got overlooked and that's low hanging systems fruit. Mm. So I, I don't know if that answered the question or not. No, no, I, think, I think it does. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, Lucien, uh, Lucia, sorry, Corsini asked, how do you deal with conflicting accounts of the past and the danger of post-rationalizing history to fit into <laughs> your understanding of current problems when tracing history? Boy, that's, that's one of the things that Tim was very, very concerned about. So I'm going to let him chime in here in a minute. But it's all subjective all the time. I think that the, the, the process, the way you, you, you check and balance that is by carefully making sure that multiple perspectives and points of view are coming into that process. And as Tim, um, as Tim emphasized, these maps that are created are as much about getting people with disparate and even conflicting points of view into a discussion as they are anything else. In fact, it's more about the process of negotiating what the map will be than it is about the artifact because ideally it would be changing all the time. But Tim, I'll let you address that more fully. Well, I would just say that the thing that I know the conversation that we had amongst the three of us through this is this concern about what I would call retrospective coherence, right? Um, which is the, the thing around post-rationalizing history. Um, the reality is that like in these complex entangled systems, they are, they are not materially linearly causal, right? So you can't say that A led to B, thus we're now at C. But with the thing that we can say is when we start recognizing patterns across the system, that the system may have certain propensities to uh, act and react and respond in certain ways. And then that becomes useful, those patterns that you recognize in proposing ecologies of interventions that might be effective at nudging the system and its propensities uh, as steps along a path in a journey towards some preferred future. Now that negotiation of what that is has to happen on a continual basis uh, going forward. But yes, I think the question is a good one. and. Um, you have to be very careful, frankly, in your mindset and posture when uh, particularly like if you have a, imagine having a large group of stakeholders who are collabor collaborating together, that you resist the temptation to draw conclusions about how something ended up. It's more about the, the patterns or the dispositional state of the system in the present. Mm. No, good, thank you, Tim. Um, there are several questions uh, which are, have a kind of common theme. So I wonder maybe if I can roll them up with Aidan Hudson Lepore. Um, says, I'd love to learn more about the methodology for constructing the systems map. How do you conduct the inventory and analysis of news stories, journals, and other sources in a repeatable way, e.g. something similar to independent coders for uh, qualitative data analysis? And I think the, there's also, you know, for me, a sense of, how on earth did you find stakeholders in, in this um, inclusion? Who were they and how did you manage to create um, a, um, a genuinely responsive um, uh, method of, of communicating with them? Yeah, 
That's a good question. And again, I want to underscore that this was a hypothetical project that we worked on. And it, the next step would be to take it out to stakeholders because it was just the three of us trying to do research and see if connections or insights would emerge that we wouldn't have come to otherwise. Um, and I think, you know, a few of the, we came to the deforestation thing long before it was showing up in the, in the news, for instance. But ideally, uh, I'm not going to say ideally, I'm going to say an approach that we uh, think is important for communities in a workshop setting is to get different stakeholder groups who have conflicting agendas together and they just start mapping with post-its what they think issues in each of those five categories are. Now, we've only done this a few times, but what you start to see is that resident wisdom, that wisdom or those strong perspectives based on experience that start showing up on the board um, are really important because you invariably then have a discussion with everybody going, oh, I didn't know that. Look at that. Huh. And they begin to see how complex the problem is. That achieves a really important uh, thing right off the bat. A lot of times, stakeholders are arguing about which solutions should be funded and implemented. And I don't care how complicated the problem is. Each group thinks they have the, the, the solution if only they had enough money for it. Well, once you start to engage them in building the complexity of this problem and they began to encounter viewpoints that they hadn't thought of before or pieces of information they didn't know about, it becomes pretty apparent immediately there's no silver bullet solution. It's like all the solutions that they can possibly think of and more will be needed. So immediately you can stop arguing about whose single solution is right. You also begin to build a shared appreciation for the level of complexity and the diversity of viewpoints. So that is one really big side of the, the approach. Once you get that, there's another phase of research that would then um, entail validating or refuting some of these perspectives, either in further field research, some of it would involve simply doing desktop research and finding out if, you know, this amount of pesticides is actually growing in, going into groundwater over here, as was alleged on a post-it. Hmm. So these maps can serve as initial diffusing of tensions with communities, but they also serve as sketches for further research. Yeah, great. Thank you, Terry. This maybe needs to be the, the kind of the last question almost to, to wrap up, but I suppose I'm really interested in, you've got such an amazing body of work now in relation to COVID. Um, and as you say, it starts to span out into all of the other crises that are going on at the moment. Um, where does this go next and what are you planning to do next in order to be able to roll this out and, and, and get it to gather some momentum? Because it feels like you have a story that really has the power to, to change quite a lot of minds. Well, it's a good question, Tim, but I think at this point we just don't know because what we've run up against is the limitations of the tools are so extreme that I it's not going to be easy to take it further. And I think, I think, frankly, given what's going on in this country right now, I can't speak for Gideon or Tim, but I just feel like as a white person, I need to sort of shut up and listen for a while before doing much more. But Tim, maybe you in particular want to say something about the limitations of the tools, which would impede us doing much more with this in the near future. Yeah, I mean, I we had very long frustrated conversations amongst the three of us that the, the tools that we have currently are not equal to the problems and conversations that we need to be having collectively as a group right and um, 
in particular, the mapping tools, they, um, we just, the, the features and functionality that exist out in the world these days um, can't really accommodate the breadth and depth and the scope uh, of, of just the, the act of mapping itself. But even more importantly than that, or equally as important is uh, facilitating the conversations that come out of that mapping exercise so that we can all collectively have a conversation, including people uh, who need to be in the room who frankly may not have the financial wherewithal or technical ability um, to otherwise participate in those conversations. And that's as much a, a tool uh, issue as it is a, a process issue and a social issue. So there's a lot of exploration to be done um, not, not only around the methodologies uh, of the practice of transition design, but just the tools that we would use to support us in having those conversations at all. Yeah. Mm, uh, okay. And I think it feels to me um, America has its, its very own very particular issues going on, but I think they're, they're, it sounds to me like your conclusions are very common to um, uh, the situation we have here as well. And that there was a report published today about the um, far higher that BAME um, uh, people are dying of COVID um, and some really serious issues that we, we all need to deal with. Um, I think we probably need to draw it to a conclusion there. Um, but can I just thank everyone again for joining us tonight and supporting the work of Schumacher College. This is the last talk in, the, um, Earth, in this series of Earth Talks, but we'll be back again in just under a month on Wednesday the 1st of July with a new series based around the theme of seizing the opportunity for radical transformation, which as I said earlier on will include speakers such as Fritjof Capra, Charles Eisenstein and Meg Wheatley. A full programme is going to be available very shortly, so do dis um, subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Twitter. I hope Terry's talk has whetted your appetite, in which case I'd point you towards the Schumacher College short course taking place in just over a year's time. It's a long time to wait, but hopefully it'll give you some time to really digest what's, what you've heard tonight, uh, called Transition Design, Speeding and Catalyzing Systems Level Change, which will be taught by Terry Gideon and Cameron Tonkinwise, who's currently in Australia. Um, you may also be interested in a number of other MAs and short courses taking place at Schumacher College. This has been our sixth online Earth Talk, so we would love to hear your feedback on how we can continue to improve and also we'd love to hear about the issues, topics or speakers you'd like to see in the future. So can I thank you all again for your very active participation. I've been watching the chat and watching the questions and I really apologize if I haven't had a chance to read out your question. Um, but we'll make sure that um, uh, Terry and Gideon and Tim also get to see all of the, all of the chat as well. Um, but can I thank once again, Terry Owen, Gideon Kossoff and Tim Gasparek. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Good Thank night. Thank you. Good night.